Sylvain Charlebois, also known as the food professor, appeared before the Agricultural Committee to talk to them about cross-border carbon adjustments with the United States and its impact on our food prices in Canada. What he revealed was pretty shocking. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. Now, I'm old enough to remember the famine in the 80s, which was quite a significant social impact. It's not only did it create uh, awareness of the conditions, the living conditions in Africa for my generation, but it also spawned three songs. Uh, Tears are not enough. Do they know it's Christmas? And we are the world. One coming from three different countries, respectively. The Canadian one is Tears are not enough. And those songs were put up so that the money could be brought forward to pay for food that we would send to the famine in Ethiopia, which basically almost broke the country. And Canada provided much, most of the food that those Ethiopians ended up um, bringing in that they could then stay alive on. Now you can look that up. There's no reason to be talking about it too, too much, except for the conditions that are happening in Canada right now are often make me reflect on how individuals who are making policy decisions that are impacting people's food are clearly people who have never been hungry, who are clearly people that have never seen the impacts of, of hunger and, and malnutrition and starvation. And I thought for a little while about oh, how to bring it, how to put it, how to encapsulate it before I let this video go, because this video is going to require me to have some impact. I have strong opinions on, on hunger and on people whose policies are designed like Stalin in the 1930s that are designed to harm the overall well-being of humanity. And then I thought about, sorry, that was the 1950s. So uh, I thought about Tupac when he did the song, he remade the song Changes. And in there he, he said a line, he goes, my stomach hurts. So I'm looking for a purse to snatch. And that basically is a strong message for people who might not understand what hunger is like. We're not talking about a situation where you desire something. We're talking about a situation where physically you can't think about anything else. If you talk about the lion safari or if you talk about the, any kind of a zoo where they're like, okay, don't worry, we fed them all. That's because if they were hungry, they would behave differently. Humans are no different. Humans are not immune to that. When humans become hungry, they do things that are rash, to do things that are, that are extreme because they are driven at a, an instinctual level, at a primal level. I'm not trying to justify it. I'm only letting you know that, you know, there's probably a lot of people who are in prison right now because they, they went to the lengths that they went to so that they could simply put food in their belly. And that, you know, is the kind of situation that we're staring at. And when we talk about food banks and when we talk about malnutrition in Canada, a country that, could, that fed the world in the 80s. And the only thing that's changed, of course, is the federal government. Now I'm going to let you hear... Uh, Mr. Chalabois speak, and I'm going to be giving it to you in snippets so that I can, because it was a two hour committee and I want you to hear the segments that I, I felt like are uh, relevant and pertinent to our particular video today. The Trudeau government has tasked the agricultural committee with looking at imposing a, a new tariff tax on food coming into the country that doesn't, that isn't grown without having a carbon tax put on it. And that's why uh, Char uh, Mr. Charlebois and these other guests are in the room. They're talking about this tariff that the federal government is wondering is a good idea to put on anything that's coming across the border as food. Instead of looking at retail prices or the retail landscape, it's critical to look at the supply chain and wholesale prices. Huge difference in terms of wholesale prices you find here in Canada versus the U.S. Since 2019, when the carbon tax was implemented, uh, wholesale prices in Canada, food wholesale prices in Canada have actually increased 
uh, by more than 37% more than in the U.S., which is significant. In other words, our wholesale prices are now less competitive uh, than uh, prices you find in the U.S. We, we have had some questions from our, our colleagues in the government uh, questioning the validity of your uh, uh, statistics that I, I saw on your social media the other day um, that the carbon price is increasing whole food, uh, wholesale food in Canada in every category more than 30 percent and food inflation in Canada is about 37 percent higher than the United States. Um, I just want to confirm with you that those numbers are correct. Uh, you know as a professor at Dalhousie University and a preeminent food expert in Canada um, are those numbers uh, that you have uh, have stated are those correct and the impact uh, the carbon price is having on Canadians is is quite significant in a negative way. Uh, absolutely. So the numbers are correct. Uh, the interpretation of those numbers uh, would need to be uh, corrected. <laughs> you know, so the U.S. numbers are coming from the federal uh, St. Louis Reserve, and uh, the data in Canada comes from Statistics Canada. What he said there was those numbers would have to be redone by the government for them to be changed. I didn't make those numbers. I didn't research those numbers. I simply found those that information was released by the uh, re the reserve in St. Louis, I believe he said, and Statistics Canada, which of course Statistics Canada's numbers can be sometimes a little bit wonky when they do their little baskets as it pertains to inflation. But you'll always hear, especially Freeland, talking about how oh it's a global problem. Yet the numbers, even okay, you know what. Let's just say for the sake of argument, let's just give her the sake of argument on this one and say, okay, so you're saying to us that the same pressures are being applied to the United States of America fiscally and economically, then how come their numbers are 37? Let's just say that we gained the same amount, except Canadian numbers have gone an additional 37%. An additional 37%. Now, if you're thinking that's the wholesale numbers, not the retail numbers. So if the wholesale numbers have gone 37%, how can the retailer offer us the food at any, any less than what they have to charge to have above and beyond that, right? Even if they only add 1% as a profit margin, which they could never do, they have to have operating costs and 37%, and then you have to add in the carbon price on the gasoline, then you have to add in wages, electricity, rent, you know, you're, you're probably coming somewhere near 50% by the time all of the calculations are, are factored into the price of whatever particular item that we're talking about. And I suppose I should take the opportunity to explain to anyone that doesn't understand the wholesale price is what the farmer sells it to, right? So the whole, the farmer will bring it to you on, let's call it in the back of a truck. And then you will take it and you will put it into individual little packages, which of course is also adding to the cost. Right, the the wholesaler is not bringing it to you pre wrapped. You you probably have to do that yourself. Or when you go in and you see fresh produce that it's just loose, that's because that's how the wholesaler provided it. And so now we're talking about as the wholesaler, we can replace that number with farmer. Now we might have an intermediary. We might have the person that grows the food. Then there might be a wholesaler that comes into the center and you know and takes it in as a cooperative and then sells it out like that. Nonetheless, the Canadian dollar, the Canadian numbers are 37% higher, which means if an American can buy it for 10 bucks, we got to pay nearly 14, we got to pay $13 and 70 cents. And that's what, that's just at parity of the dollar. This is a serious and massive amount when you add it up over time. And then you wonder why grocery, like the liberal government tries to convince you that they're worrying about competition. Professor Chalabois has some more numbers about the food price differences between the United States and Canada. Let's listen to them. They are very revealing, very shocking. We can speculate that the carbon tax did not help our cause. Uh, since April 2019, Canada's RSPI retail prices index has increased by approximately 32.5%. 47%, while wholesale prices in Canada have increased by 42.26%. If you look at figure two, you'll see that there's basically no gap between wholesale and retail anymore. So wholesale, wholesale food prices are putting way more pressure on retail, making, uh, making our food 
essentially more expensive. Now, again, you could speculate that uh, wholesale prices are pushed up by policies like the carbon tax. The wholesale prices and the retail prices in Canada have very little, no difference. So when the so now, instead of uh, MP Champagne telling us that it's all the grocery store's fault, what we can see is when the grocery store comes out and says, we're not making any money, we're, we're working on the thinnest of margins, they're in all likelihood being honest because the numbers state that the wholesale price and the retail price are very close to one another. So if we were to remove the carbon tax from the, from the wholesaler, that would push down their, their production costs which would mean in turn that the grocery stores could sell it to you for less money. But the liberal government and, you know, Stephen Gilbo, they don't seem to care. I guess they don't have to worry about how much food costs. You hear Stephen Gilbo and um, Champagne and Freeland all talking about how because of the carbon tax, we're now going to be competitive, right? Because of the carbon tax, we're now going to be leading the world. Well, the... Uh, I mean, I've never believed it, and I've never agreed with it, clearly. But let's let uh, Professor Charlebois explain it. In other words, just looking at the data right now, Canada is put at a, at a disadvantage over Canada. Essentially, the core of my message is that right now, wholesale prices in the U.S. are moving at a much uh, slower pace than in Canada right now, putting more pressure on retail. And of course, you can speculate that the agri-food sector in Canada is less competitive. With lower and no federal carbon pricing in the U.S., American food producers are not burdened with the same environmental costs, creating an uneven playing field in the North American market. Creating an, unplay, an uneven playing field in the North American market. That's what the carbon tax has done to the food prices in this country. It has made our food less competitive inside of our own country. The issue is not just about direct financial burdens, but also about the systemic cost increases across energy, transportation, and input supplies, which enhance inflationary pressures across the board. The carbon tax likely adds a significant cost burden to the Canadian food industry that is not faced by U.S. producers, making Canadian products more expensive and less competitive, both domestically and internationally. What he said there was the food chain, the, 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 the chain that of events, right? So now... The, the farmer has gas piped in, right, to all of his various buildings where his lights are working or all of his various drying bins. So this is air. First, we've added carbon tax to the delivery of the seed. Then the seed or, or whatever it happens to be, maybe the chickens, maybe, you know, the, whatever you have, what product you happen to be talking about. But let's try, try to say with fresh produce. All of the beginning parts of that are all now heavily ta overtaxed by the carbon tax. They are right out of the gate that much more expensive than they would be in the United States. Which means that an apple grown in British Columbia is going to be 40% more expensive than the very same apple grown in Oregon. Or wheat grown in Saskatchewan is going to be 40% more expensive than wheat grown in one of the Dakotas. Which... The only difference, of course, is the, an arbitrary line of the border between Canada and the United States. The climates are identical. The soils are going to be identical. The only thing that is, that is, that is different is the, the federal policies on carbon tax. And we can go right down the board with that, right? We can talk about how tomatoes in Mexico can be grown and shipped across the continent and sold in Canada for less money than tomatoes that were grown down the street because of the amount of carbon tax that they put on the carbon that's put into the greenhouses, right? Or the amount of carbon that's put into the fertilizers. Now we're going to get to that, but I want to draw into you the, a, a concept of how this, there's no, there's, we're, we're talking about the same weather conditions, the same climate, right? Oregon to British Columbia, they touch the only thing that's different, the Dakota into Saskatchewan, they touch. That there's no there's no difference in in anything except for the federal government, right? Except for the carbon tax. Just because one is on Canada and one is in the United States, that's the only thing that's driving up that's separating the costs. Now, talking about some of the impact of those costs, that's something that we're leaving out of the discussion. That's something that they're trying to look at. 
And MP Barlow, conservative MP Barlow, has got a really uh, strong, shocking point to make. And I, I want you to hear it because it is staggering to think that we are living in a first world country that has this. Thank you very much for that. Um, we saw a news report this morning when I was walking into my office, which I found to be quite uh, surprising, to be honest, is that uh, Canadian doctors are warning um, their colleagues about the potential of having scurvy uh, once again uh, arrive in Canada, which is not something I ever anticipated I'd have to deal with. Um, but they were saying this is a result of vitamin C deficiency and Canadians not eating enough of healthy food. And again, they attributed that to the high cost of, of groceries. Um, I think we have to look at every aspect as potentially driving up costs of food for Canadians. We're seeing 2 million Canadians go to food banks. Um, I know this isn't exactly necessarily about a carbon uh, border adjustment, but I think any additional impediment we put on on our agriculture industry processors, manufacturers is going to have an impact. Are, are you surprised to see a headline like that, or is this not surprising to you who's followed this closely? No, I actually read the report uh, very concerned but unfortunately, not surprised either. Uh, we're releasing a report on Thursday about uh, food expenditures in Canada and retail wise, uh, food expenditures have remained flat despite higher food prices. This only means that people are avoiding the periphery of the store uh, where fresh products are, where vitamins, uh, good vitamins and minerals are, including vitamin C. And people will go to the center of the store to escape from inflationary pressures. That's exactly what's happening right now. A lot of families are facing that reality. So the last thing you need to do is to put more pressure on the border to make food even more expensive in Canada. Scurvy. Scurvy inside of Canada, which is ridiculous. I mean, historically, scurvy was given to men who lived on boats, right? Who had to sail around the, the countries. They were getting scurvy because they were out on the boat and didn't have any fresh food. Scurvy is not a first world issue. Well, at least it wasn't until the liberal government took the reins of Canada, the, what was before known as the breadbasket of the world. I mean, we produce more wheat in Saskatchewan out in our plains than any five countries put together, except for Russia. Everybody else, they, don't, they pale in comparison. That's why Canada was able to send so much wheat to the Ethiopia in the 1980 famine, which clearly our liberal government doesn't care about. Now, MP Barlow finished his questions, and then the liberals got their turn, their six-minute turn. And you will not believe, I can't believe it myself, the way she addressed this question of the scurvy. She spoke to it, right, on her round, the, uh, the liberal MP she uh, says, oh, well, you'll hear it. And I'm telling you right now, I, unbelievable. I, I just also wanted to go back to some of the original um, things that were, were mentioned in terms of vitamin C, scurvy, and um, sounds again like a nuclear winter kind of uh, scenario. And um, the, when we were, had another study, I remember um, somebody coming in saying the, the increase in the price of, for example, orange juice and oranges or um, produce was largely due to climate events, that the drought in California, for example, or the romaine lettuce that was diseased or in Florida had caused great spikes. And I, and I do recall. We have people that are starving to death that are suffering from such, such profound malnutrition that they have a medical name for it that their body's nails are falling out, their hair is falling out, that scurvy is causing them to start to literally starve to death. It's not a nuclear winter. It's malnutrition. It's a famine. It's a famine. Now, if you've ever been hungry, you understand what I'm saying to you. You know what I know? This lady has never been hungry. This lady who is so desperate to try not to look bad because she hears that it's scurvy and now she knows it makes her look bad and she tries to dismiss it by saying this is a Californian problem this is a Florida problem you know what she didn't point to she didn't point to the fact that there was an economic there was an ecological disaster in Canada that could cause the food to be not as inexpensive to be less expensive the only thing we have is a man-made disaster known as the carbon tax in the liberal party but I'll tell you something that she 
overlooked in her ignorance, in her in her dismissiveness of the of the of the disaster of this policy of the of the malnutrition that people are suffering in Canada. Unbelievable. She's like, oh, the bananas in California or the oranges in Florida. You know what has more vitamin C than an orange? A tomato. Many people don't realize, but a tomato is technically a fruit based on the amount of vitamin C that it possesses. So when you tell me that we could be avoiding scurvy with oranges from Florida or bananas from California, neither of those things grow very well in our climate. But apples grow really well. And tomatoes can be grown in a greenhouse, a greenhouse that you have put so much taxes on, whether it be the taxes for the light, the taxes for the carbon that goes into the air, the taxes to keep the warm, the temperature of it, the, the taxes that's cost on the, on the greenhouse itself, the structure, that it's less expensive to buy a Mexican tomato than it is to necessarily buy a Canadian tomato. And that includes the, amen, the amount of stuff that a person who who is living in the poor might be able to afford canned tomato sauce, which if they just made some spaghetti or something, then they might be able to stave off some of these problems. But the, ca- the price of the tomatoes are so high that people can't purchase them. And they're buying the stuff that lets their body feel like it's tricked. So it's got the, like it's tricked into being full. So it's got the high fat, it's got the high carb, which normally always comes alongside with high salt. And that sort of convinces the body that it's full and then the mind can calm down, though it's not necessarily achieving the nutrients that it requires clearly. That we're talking about a doctor who said, this isn't an isolated case of scurvy. I got a whole bunch of them coming in. So let me let the college of of physicians know and we can release this to the public just like we did with any of the other potentially life-threatening problems that come to Canada number 19. But this lady doesn't care about any of that. All she cares is that you, she thinks in her mind that you can't blame the liberals for it. That it's some random impact in Florida. Well, let's take the carbon price off the tomatoes and let's see how, how low the price can get. Let's just watch and see if we can't make sure that food banks get massive donations of crushed tomatoes because they're so inexpensive. Or tomato soup or tomato juice. Any number, any one of which would stave off scurvy for a person who is suffering from it. Unbelievable. And then they try to convince you that somebody else is playing politics. People are going hungry, and all you can talk about is the climate. Don't worry, though. This MP, I believe her name is Taylor Roy, is her, uh, MP Taylor Roy, has more real nuggets of of wisdom and insight to offer to this particular issue. It's got nothing to do with her partisanship. It's got nothing to do with her politics at all. If you believe that, I got a bridge I can sell you. I just want you to hear it. There was another, uh, one of the other um, experts that was invited is from the Canadian Foundation for People Who Grow uh, Organic. And of course, she didn't want to speak to anybody, but she so she turned to the person in the room, the organics lady. But I was wondering, too, um, uh, Ms. Lossgard, or T, if I could call you that, um, you were talking about organics, and I'm assuming that in the organic sector, given what you've discussed and the way that organics are already regulated and produced, um, that the organic sector would do very well compared to the carbon intensity of um, organics produced in other areas, for example, the United States. Yeah, I think um, when it comes to organic products, of course, I think they're unfortunately like a little bit different than other forms of agriculture because they already have the built-in standards that are really focused on uh, low carbon emissions and, and nitrogen yeah. and, and avoidance of um, synthetic pesticides, which mm-hmm. of course is something that uh, is contributing to some of the carbon issues. So I think this is where... Um, what we see happening in other jurisdictions is very progressive policies where they're trying to incentivize organic as one of the solutions. Instead of putting the, the stick, they're putting the carrot. Mm-hmm. And so this is where, you know, I think from our perspective, we could imagine that our trade partners would agree that car- that if they were to do a, um, a, carbon, a, a border carbon adjustment, that organic should not be a part of that. Right. Um, Excellent. Organic should not be a part of that, she says, because organic, as you saw the body language, right? She, in her mind, but what organic really is, is this much more expensive. 
Have you ever gone into the store and looked at, say, the, the difference between a, 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 a banana and an organic banana or, or organic anything? Or a tomato and an organic tomato? Have you seen the price difference? For a product that, that has less uses, it seems to cost a lot more. I don't understand that. You put less in the soil, you put less on it, and yet it costs twice as much with this organic label. Now, I think that when we were, when we were facing the economic issues of 40% higher in this country than in, than in our immediate neighbor, meaning that those guys could come up here and undercut every, every retailer that we have, every f- agricultural facet can be undercut by the prices that the Americans can offer it to us. And she's talking about how organic, because it already follows a lot of greenhouse gas problems, because it already adheres to a bunch of carbon tax rules, though twice as much money. You see how it went right over their heads, right? That they're saying that they they adhere to this carbon stuff, but organic is quite expensive. And she feels that it wouldn't be subject to more tariffs because it's already following all of these greenhouse adjustments. And yet... You and I both know that when you go into the grocery store, organic is considerably higher. And only people who have the funds and the means can buy organic and and ingest it. The rest of us have to go with what was grown. And I think that that is an important distinction. I believe that if anybody reads a history book, they would understand that one of the biggest problems of the Great Depression that they never mentioned, one of the single largest issues of the Great Depression was at the same time there was a, a weather event. They call it the Dust Bowl, where all of what we call today the the breadbasket wasn't producing any food, any wheat. So there was no agriculture. At the time, this was a very strong impact on on the economy. A lot of jobs were rooted in that kind of stuff. Then we got through World War II, and we started to use a lot of machinery, and people started to create things, and the jobs that would have necessarily gone to agriculture went to manufacturing. Now, I don't want to take you too far down an economic lesson, But I do want you to understand that starvation was rife in the world during the Great Depression. That many people in Germany, one of their biggest grievances that the Germans had with the rest of the world is that many people in that country, you know, they they went to the final demise because they didn't have any food. The same happened in the United States of America. The same happened everywhere because there was no there was none being produced because of the Great Dust Bowl. This lady talking like the organics is going to save the world. Meanwhile, it's putting it out of reach for most of the culture. Most of the people can't afford to even buy what food we have, never mind buying the food that's priced three times as high, even if we are generous and call it twice as high. Where do you expect these individuals to get the money? You, you want the, the student who flew here from India and is living 25 deep in a basement apartment to all of a sudden to be afford, able to afford organics? You tone... Uh, Oh my, not going to let them get me that cross, though I, I promise you that had I been in the room, there would have been that the tone would have been much different. Because I can't stand the idea that these people expect us, to, these are the kinds of people who have never suffered through these things, and then they, would, they wouldn't understand what it feels like firsthand, and then they tell you that you should just, you know, do something about it, right? They don't understand what the, how the firsthand reaction, they don't understand it in any way, shape, or form. They're not even trying to understand it. They are quite the opposite. They're dismissive of it. Scurvy. Carbon pricing is putting our food 40% higher than it is in the United States of America. And they want you to believe that it's no big deal. Of course, we can't get much coverage on that because the press in Canada is bought and paid for. So they're not doing the stories on this stuff. So they're not getting the message. So you got to rely on channels like mine who are not, who are kind of looking at it and looking for the facts and looking for the truth. Now, I admit I'm a little wound up, but I think that this is an avoidable problem. I believe that in the 1980s when, when people were starving in Northern Africa, the world said, wait a minute, let's stop what we're doing and get them fed. And many of the policies and many of the, of the procedures that we use in agriculture today are to avoid famine. They are to make sure that people have enough to eat. And putting a tax on food is just the most ridiculous concept I've ever heard of. I know that people write about it in a book, and I know that that book's available on Amazon and all of that stuff, but that doesn't mean that I agree with that policy, and that certainly doesn't mean that I agree with the idea that you should ignore it when it's happening. 
there is a problem here with the price of our food. And you can put carbon pricing on gasoline and all you want and all that kind of stuff until it starts to affect the basics. Rent, food, shelter, I should have said, and food. These things should be a human right. And nothing, nothing should interfere with making them both affordable and abundant. Nothing. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.